Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith. Have you ever stopped to think about what makes music funny and what makes a good action score? And what can a composer do that completely sucks the life out of their composition? In today's episode, we're talking to composer Matt Novak. We discuss all of this and really dive deep into the details. So if you want to learn about how to compose this type of music, this is the episode for you. Matt Novak is a classically trained composer and percussionist whose intuitively smart scores have created indelible moments in mostly comedy projects across series and film. Matt's music supports performances by many of today's greatest comedic actors, including Amy Poehler, Paul Rudd, Rob Corddry, Megan Mullally, Henry Winkler, and Will Arnett. Some of his notable credits include working cult favorite Children's Hospital, Netflix A Murderville, as well as award-winning Dog Days and spots for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. His most recent work can be heard on TBS's Miracle Worker and Times. So Matt Novak, thanks so much for being here and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Um, thanks, Christine. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk with you. I love your work. I think it's so fun and it's innovative. And I love how it brings so much comedic aspects to the work that you do. And I can't wait to kind of pick your brain on how you do all of that. Well, thank you. Yeah. So now you are a classically trained composer and drummer percussionist. So how did you end up from there to working on End of Times or Miracle Workers? Gotcha. So my entire... Let's just start from the beginning. Year, uh, <laughs> career journey. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, growing up, I always loved listening to film scores, film soundtracks. Um, you know, then on heavy metal. While other kids were blasting rock, I was blasting film scores in the car. Um, so I always knew I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. uh, I was a percussionist. I went to school for percussion performance and composition uh, secondary. Wait, both? I did both. I was uh, went to school for uh, percussion, uh, and then did like a second, like a minor in composition. Wow! Uh, and then I uh, I pivoted fully to composition, and that's when I got my de- undergrad degree in music okay. composition. Okay, because I was thinking that those percussionist performance majors were probably some of the busiest musicians in the music department. Yeah, we're pretty, pretty busy. <laughs> um, and you know, I was always good with like marimba uh, keyboard uh, instruments, like marimba, xylophone, vibes. Mm-hmm. That helped. Eventually, pivoted to full time composition, and then graduated. That went to grad school at USC. Did their uh, scoring for motion pictures and television program, and they got me my first job working as a an assistant for a composer named Stephen Stern. So that, that got me my start. I worked as a, an assistant for another composer named Craig Wedren, um, who uh, recommended me to Children's Hospital, which became my breakout role. And that started my career. I worked for the same producers a lot. Uh, Miracle Workers I got because one of those producers, David Wayne, uh, recommended me for that show. Mm-hmm. I love how you always knew that you loved film scores and then you just kind of took that and went with it. And you, did you always have that goal in mind or when you were doing performance or when you were doing classical study, did you think, oh, maybe I want to do art music instead? Or did you always, always know it was going to be film music? I think I always knew um, that I wanted to do film music and always seemed to gravitate towards composers who had a very cinematic style. Mm-hmm. I was a big fan of Michael Doherty uh, mm-hmm. when I was in college. Still am. His pieces always seemed very cinematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could see the picture in your head when you listen to his music. When I was composing, I would always try to picture images in my head. When I would, like try to like score some imaginary film in my head when I was writing uh, in college. My first uh, composition teacher, Rob Deemer, was an uh, alumni of the USC film scoring program. So he, he was like the one who told me about it. He was obviously very supportive. And then my other professors were very supportive too. That's great. I love it that they supported what your goals were instead of trying to fit you into what their idea of success was. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's really great. <laughs> that's really great. And then you also, you said that uh, your experience with the marimba and the xylophone help you with your composing now. 
Um, but what about the other things? Do you feel like when you're composing that you come at it from more of a rhythmic standpoint when you see a scene or is, do you stick with like the melodic um, structure? How do you, how do you usually come about with things? Yeah, it, it depends on the scene. I like to try at least my first thing I do is I'll watch a scene over and over again. I'll get it in my head, kind mm -hmm. of memorize it. And I'll just kind of figure out what was the key things that the scene needs. If it's a rhythm, if it's a pulse, uh, if it's a melody, if it's a type of chord progression, type of scale. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do that first. And so, yeah, I do use when I write action cues, I do use a lot of rhythm, a lot of percussion, ostinatos, rhythmic patterns. Um, but yeah, it just it just depends. <laughs> Isn't that fun, though? I think that's yeah. one of the great things about film music is that you, it gives you some freedom and you write in some for so many different types of scenes that you can really just experiment with things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. I like to try to I don't. Um, there are certain styles I like to write in, but I, I don't like to just stick to one. I like to try mm -hmm. to stretch my wings and try different styles, different genres, um, mm -hmm. and not repeat myself. I'll, I'll do a score and then look back on it and just think about what worked, think about what I could have could done differently, uh -huh. and just kind of take that with me into the next score. Gotcha. Um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it sure does. So what is your favorite genre to write in? Uh, I love writing action music. Um, but I My first kind of writing gig with the music library was uh, trailer music. Uh, okay. I do, do big, epic uh, trailer albums. Um, haven't done that in a while. I'm actually getting back into it a little bit, I hope, I think. Um, but that was like just big orchestra, big pounding percussion, you know, aggressive sense and that's that's a lot of fun mm -hmm. um a lot of work it can be exhausting um sometimes when i write action cues like for harley i remember there's there's some for harley quinn where i worked on an action, action cue for a couple of days and i was just flat out exhausted afterwards really? just because i just really get into it and i i just so <laughs> Probably okay, for my own health, I should probably stay away from action cues, but uh, I do love <laughs> writing them. moderation what is it that makes it so exhausting uh i i just get into it i i just like i don't know maybe it's because i like i grew up with heavy metal i just kind of like really just get into it and and I'll, I'll just i'll just keep going and just not the the downside is that i'll just get so focused that i just won't take breaks so i'll just be into it for hours at a time and just like i'll, just, I'll, I'll be done i'm just like oh, i just i gotta i gotta sleep for a day and a half you know just <laughs> Um, All right. So then what makes a really, really good action cue when you're finished with it and you mm. say, oh, that was a good one. What are some aspects that, oh, that was good? Hmm. That's a good question. Very good question. I don't know if I've ever thought about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I would say a good hook, okay. uh, whether it's like a you're a cool ostinato. Um, you know, I usually save big themes for heroic moments or mm -hmm. um, the inverse of that. So, like, very, like, this moment of despair, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but it would be, like, good ostinatos, like, hooky, you know, no memorable ostinatos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I like pounding percussion, pounding drums, you know, being a percussionist. Um, I think the simple answer is energy. 
you know, okay. what makes a good action key is energy. Um, if an action scene is more like intimate, if it's more personal, uh-huh. it actually might be better with like a simple piece of music or sometimes even no music. If it's just, it can get more raw and have more despair to the action scene without music or without a very minimal music. So it kind of also just depends on what emotion the, yeah. you want to, you want the audience to, to feel during the action scene. Um, but if it's a big heroic action scene, yeah, just make it big and epic. Yeah, fine. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Another genre that you do a lot of is comedy. I look at your um, the amount of projects, these amazing projects that you've done, and so many them of them are comedic. And I think that I think for everything, for writing, acting, music, comedy, and being funny is probably the most difficult, in my opinion. How do you do that? How do you? What makes music funny? I don't know if there's anything really difficult about writing music for comedy. Mm-hmm. It's just having a sense of the comedy itself, just being aware of where the jokes are, where the comedy lies so that you're enhancing it and not distracting it. I do a lot of absurdist comedies. That's like kind of 95% of the type of comedy I, I do like children's hospital miracle workers. Um, Miracle Workers also had a little bit of a sitcom vibe to it, too. But uh, Absurdist, the comedy comes from the characters being, or the actors portraying the characters as if these absurd situations are really happening to the characters. So that's like, it's not funny to the characters. Mm -hmm. So the, the score needs to play that reality of the characters. So a lot of Absurdist comedies, I'll score it straight like i was scored like a drama or um you know children's hospital is a medical drama so it does a lot of medical type cues in it um and and that comedy comes from everyone playing these silly things realistically and reacting to them realistically but i still need to pay attention to the comedy not stepping on any jokes not being too dramatic or Mm -hmm. too scary or you know it's it's there's still it's a still i guess the trick is there's a fine line i might overwrite a little bit and i was wondering yeah yeah and then pull things back you know as i they kind of find that find that balance um also i will carve out space for jokes so it's if there's a there's a funny line or funny punchline, i will just stop the cue right before mm-hmm. that line um I, I like to use negative space in that way um you know, avoid like doing anything like to like dingy like you don't want to the thing you don't want to do uh is to like put a bell like a ding like ding this is a joke and oh. it, it, like you don't want to do that <laughs> okay like, don't yeah. do that. that'll make it less funny um in my opinion mm-hmm. uh but I, I like to use negative space. So it's like if there's, you know, a heartfelt cue, I will make sure that it wraps up before the for the joke or even wraps out, wraps up prematurely to kind of emphasize that joke that way. Yeah. Just being aware of where the comedy lies. And I think a lot of that also comes from um, just experience from doing it a lot and collaborating with great comedy minds. Gotcha. And you were talking about about sitcoms is different. Oh, yeah. I would say yeah, sitcoms are a little different um, in that those are more about setting a tone. In sitcoms, you'll see transition pieces of music that carries the audience from one scene to the next. Mm-hmm. It's very rare that a sitcom cue plays through a scene. Like in absurdist comedies, it's score like a drama. So there's, there'll, there'll be a cue throughout a scene with lots of dialogue. Uh, sitcoms usually, usually typically don't do that. Um, it's more about setting a tone and with miracle workers, uh, we did want to give it a little bit of a sitcom vibe. Uh, so there's, it's interesting, you know, thinking about miracle workers and also children's hospital, I think about as both shows each having two different scores. Like there's the core score of the show itself, you know, children's hospital is like a medical drama. Uh, and then in Miracle Workers, 
you know, it was a sitcom-y kind of 80s Mad Max vibe. There was a lot of, you know, establishing cues where we were just set up the tone, um, leave it open-ended in the uh, unresolved cadence or e- mm-hmm. even no cadence at all um, because it's still like in the middle of a story mm-hmm. and it saves the resolution for the end of the episode, um, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, uh, okay. Why yeah. is it kind of fascinating? You yeah. gotta... I always kind of feel a little embarrassed, embarrassed that I didn't know this before because okay. uh, it's not something that ever came up in college. And when I worked for other composers, um, a sitcom cue was a cue that was short. You're mm-hmm. like, like it was just like an establishing scene, a transition cue, or like, oh, okay. And then uh, we're talking about like unresolved cues, like how do you know when to resolve? Um, and the advice I was given by someone uh, was that, oh, I'll, I'll just I'll start unresolved. If, if it feels okay, I'll leave it that way. But if it feels like it needs resolve i'll do it then okay that kind of makes sense mm-hmm. um but and this is where the embarrassing part comes from uh when i was working on miracle workers we were trying to we had a lot of time beginning to kind of play around with ideas with the score and try to figure out what the score did and one of the ideas that the showrunners threw out is like hey let's let's maybe try 90s sitcom score Okay, I that's interesting because I don't know, and I it dawned on me that I don't think I've ever like really studied '90s sitcoms from a like critical analysis of what the scores do. Okay, so like okay, well I'll think I'll 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 pull up some Family Matters, some Full House, and just see what they do. And it wasn't I was shocked and realized at least the episode of. Full House I watched uh, had no score at all. It was completely dry, except for a montage, which was a song that was some song that was licensed. Um, mm-hmm. But Family Matters had like a traditional sitcom score, and uh, it like it sounds so silly for me to say this, but I'm going to be honest. I'm going to lay my heart bare. It blew my mind when I was watching this episode. Uh, I can't remember what the episode was. And it's like, oh my god! Uh, all these cues are unresolved. Uh, none of these cues are resolving itself. <laughs> like, how's wh- how's this work? And then, at the very end of the episode, the very last cue of the episode, that's the one that resolved. And Makes I go, sense because yeah, they wrapped up because this the whole time the story is still happening. Yeah, and they didn't want to tell the audience that the story is done. And uh-huh. it's like. It, it's so it's <laughs> I feel so silly saying this because it's something I should have known but it's like I just I just never made the I just never I just never made the conscious effort to like study a sitcom mm-hmm. from a score standpoint and it just it's like it was like an epiphany it was like a very silly epiphany I had like oh yeah and now I'm I'm watching. I notice a lot too. I've been going through rewatching uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation, and a lot, so many of those cues are unresolved. And I'm just like, oh yeah, that's just, that's just how it works. And then I then I look back at my own music and how many cues I ended resolved that I probably could have just left unresolved. I probably should have. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I I probably so many of your listeners are like, yeah, Matt. Yeah, we all know this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe <laughs> now, maybe their minds are being blown, and they're like, know, "Oh like, my goodness!" <laughs> hey, like this blew my mind. Maybe if it blew at least one other person's mind, be saying this. Well, then, then, then you know, I'm going to be going and watching some more episodic shows to see which ones are unresolved and which ones aren't. I'm yeah. that's like my weekend. I've got it planned out now. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. And you know that would I would now I just thought of um, sometimes I think about. I think back to in college, you know, especially USC, which I loved. I loved going do, doing that program. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people ask me, like, well, what do you wish you would have learned from that? And I'll say, I've said in the past, like, you know, they, they're really great at talking about scoring scenes and writing themes uh, and different techniques. Really great at getting you started. But... I would have loved to discuss like strategies of how to plan out like a full score, like a full, 
oh. feature film score, a full score of TV. And I guess, I guess that just comes from just watching a lot of films and watching a lot of TV. Mm-hmm. But like, that's something I wish I kind of, and I, I still love to learn. I still love to learn new things and be, have my mind blown from silly little things that I should have known years ago. But, mm-hmm. um, so you're talking about like the over, overarching yeah. structure of an entire score over the course of like a two hour movie. I, mean, I think it's probably something that comes just with experience and everyone just mm-hmm. kind of has their own strategies. I feel like I change my strategy every time. Uh, it's just kind of what I feel like doing, but yeah. it's, it's nice to learn from other composers and figure out what other composers do. And, um, but I think it also is still kind of personal. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, personal feeling of how you feel about a particular project, film or show or whatever. I think it depends also on the relationship you have with the showrunner or the director, because that that's them putting a lot of trust in you. If you're like, hey, I have this theme. I want to develop it as the character develops. What do you think? And they're like, ah, no, stick with the temp track. Just, you know, like it can be that can be a little bit tricky navigating that as well, I think. Yeah. It, it can be a little tricky. And also, I think I see it as a challenge and mm-hmm. just like uh, try to figure out if, if a uh, director or producer really loves the temp, try to figure out what about the temp that they like and then figure out how to work my theme, my ideas in with those. But yeah, trying to figure out instead of just like blatantly copying the temp or knocking off the temp, um, which is good for doing parodies parodies you have to do that but um try to weave aspects of the temp into your what you're already doing or or what you want to do Mm -hmm. um which is a challenge but can be a fun challenge sometimes it can be a fun puzzle Mm -hmm. um when you're finding these other uh temp tracks are you keeping within the same sort of vein or same feeling as the ones that the production team gives you and you're just yeah, or like a tone, um, okay. um, an overall tone. So it's, you know, like Miracle Workers, for example, um, went to it at the beginning, went through a few rounds of the score, like what the score would be like. Mm-hmm. So the first round was pretty much all my ideas um, after having a conversation with the uh, showrunners to figure out what they wanted. Um, and then kind of refine that. And then after, as we were refining it, uh, one of the things was trying to figure out, okay, we, they wanted like an 80s VHS vibe, but what specifically kind of yes. 80s VHS vibe. So I started researching more 80s scores and then ultimately started studying uh, scores by Giorgio Moroder and John Carpenter, which I jokingly started calling I, I really hope this is not insulting i don't mean it that way but i started calling it dirty synth uh-huh. so like things with a lot of distortion and analog like grit to it and kind of like a tactile feel more yeah. of a tactile feel to it than like you know the clean type of mm-hmm. sense so once i once we figured that out that's when it really clicked with mm-hmm. all of us um so I kept those scores open, you know, to reference whenever I needed to. Um, so now, did you use analog synth machines or did you uh, manipulate things that were uh, digital? It was, on my end, it was all digital. Um, my, uh, I wish I had room for, uh, my home studio does not have the room for uh, <laughs> They're pretty uh, analog machines. They're <laughs> huge. They're huge. Someday, someday. I would love to... Uh, get a collection going um the uh the composer who worked with me greg martin uh we've known for he started as my go-to guitarist and he's a good composer himself he did some work on it um he had a small analog box that Uh he liked to play with um he also recorded some percussion too that we used um at my end it was all soft sense uh, mm-hmm. which then i would like if it was we used samples of the triton and the juno mm-hmm. um so at least they were samples of old 80s 
mm-hmm. uh, synths. And uh, if I need a new sound and I used a uh, more of a modern synth, like I use Dune 3 a lot and Diva, um, I would make sure to uh, dirty them up. Uh, if they're a, a stereo synth, made sure to move, change it to mono mm-hmm. um, and then add reverb or delay to kind of widen it back up. Uh, used a, uh, a lot of tape distortion. Uh, what was the plugin called? A RC90, I want to say. Um, there's yeah. even a preset called 80s VHS. Well, that's really interesting that you're able to do that. And so you took that, you took this uh, 80s VHS vibe and you kept a lot of cues unresolved throughout the throughout the scenes. And yeah. um, and did you did you play did you score that pretty straight? I mean, it, or did you try to work up comedy there? Like how? Because I guess I don't know. It's not quite as absurdist, is? It? I mean, I suppose it is. But what? How did you handle that? So it was a bit of a mix. Uh, like I mentioned before, like the two different kinds of scores. Yes. In yeah. one project. Um, we had a, a mandate, all of us, all of us to avoid pizzicato strings. Nothing takes away a comedy of a scene than music that's trying to be funny. So the trick was to using synths, trying to find like a light, bouncy thing, like a fun. Using light. dirty synths to make things sound. Yeah, light. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Light, light, light and dirty. As you look over your career with all this comedy and absurdist, and um, and then you know you have some video games as well. Like you've you've done a, a huge variety of things. Um, what is the project that you feel like you've learned the most from? My first show, Children's Hospital. Um, you know that went for seven seasons, and the same thing each season. I tried to do different things, but also in the later seasons, it became much more. Um, parody focused Mm -hmm. like the last two seasons i feel like every episode it was a different parody so each time i was uh, i was like okay we're parodying this time this episode we're parodying parodying uh mission impossible or or the fugitive or um or a documentary score i had to kind of break down the temp analyze it figure out what makes those scores work and then do my own version of it and doing that, I think I learned more just doing that than anything. I think that's a great way to learn. And I think you're right. That is how students learn, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a great way to learn. That's yeah. the way that sticks with me mm-hmm. the most. Um, like lately, I've been trying to dig into um, what makes uh, John Williams' harmonies work. Oh. And, and it's like... <laughs> there you uh, go. <laughs> not that I could say, not that I even cl- can even remotely claim that I could write like that. But like, once I, you know, start kind of seeing his tricks, the things he tends to do, like, okay, I can start of seeing, I can start by kind of seeing how he comes to these results. Yeah. Because um, they're so complex. Mm-hmm. But there is also like, once you kind of dig it, there is some like, there's some simplicity to it. The complexity is in the result, but I can kind of see like how he mm-hmm. arrives at those results. You're coming um, full circle back to the classical upbringing. Exactly. Again. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah, that's, that's awesome. It has been such a fun conversation with you. I have loved just picking your brain and seeing how you think about things and how you're learning. I love it that you're still learning and you're still, you still have that sense of wonder that I think is just awesome that musicians need in their careers for sure. So as we finish up, what advice do you have for aspiring musicians or aspiring composers? Well, for composers, I always give the same piece of advice. I should probably think of something else someday. Um, uh, I highly recommend finding another composer to work for as, uh, as an assistant. Uh, like I mentioned before, I worked as a composer assistant for two different composers. Um, and I just learned so much. Um, uh, I did learn a ton from you from going to school. USC was great at giving a foundation for 
film and TV scoring. And there are other programs like that too. Those are great. I do recommend those. But I think I learned even more working for a composer, seeing how they worked, getting experience in the industry. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. For musicians, I would say I would give at least musicians that want to work on film and TV scores. Mm -hmm. I give some of the same similar advice. I would say reach out to composers. Composers, we all have a roster of musicians that we can we can call up to um, uh, to hire to record, even if it's just like a sim simple like a solo recording. Um, um, just reach out um, and say, hey, I'm a musician looking for scoring work. Uh, if you ever need help with this particular instrument, let me know. Or, you know, uh, ask them a coffee or something. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my recommendation for musicians. That's great. I actually, we have never gotten that advice from anyone yet. So oh. I love that. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, I, I would even say... Uh, when you, if you're in LA, New York, Nashville, find out who your orchestra contractors are. Uh, the the people that are, the composers will hire them to put together an orchestra to work to record a score. Um, another violinist friend of mine is my go-to contractor. His name is Mark Robertson in Los Angeles. Um, that would be a good person to know. For musicians to reach out to figure out who the contract there's a few in la um and i'm sure there's in nashville and new york and i'm sure there are um, some some mixing engineers do contracting work too mm. um uh, so yeah that would be a good person to reach out to as well okay. uh, if you're looking to for getting work and, and scoring great Great. Well, Matt, you are so much fun. Thank you so much for being here and chatting with me. It's just been such a pleasure talking with you. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. It has been fun. <laughs>